Welcome to Rivers Church Online. Today's message was recorded live at River Santon at one of our Sunday services. You tuned in for just the message, but a full service includes praise and worship, personal prayer, fellowship, and so much more. Enjoy today's message, and if you've been inspired by the ministry, we'd love to welcome you to a service at one of our five campuses. So head over to www.rivers.church for information on our service times and locations. We've been looking at the book of Genesis in our teaching series, and we finished it last week. And I want to draw a little bit of a comparison as I introduce the message today. In the book of Genesis, we read about Adam and Eve, and we read about what's called beginnings. Isn't that true? In fact, we read about creation and beginnings. But when we come to the book of John in the New Testament, if you've got your books with you this morning, we're going to read some verses in a moment from the book of John. When we come to John, we don't read about creation and beginnings. We read about new beginnings and a new creation. And John ushers in something fresh. In the book of Genesis, God started a beginning with Adam, but Adam fell. God started again with a new beginning with Noah, but Noah got drunk, and after him, people continued to sin. Then God chose Abraham, and there was a beginning with Abraham, in fact, the Jewish nation, and the beginnings of a new working of faith with Abraham. But in the book of John, we read about Jesus and new beginnings. In fact, in the book of Genesis, we read about the Father creating, but in the book of John, the Gospel of John, we read about the Son recreating. And uh, John's Gospel is unique. Before we read it this morning, Matthew starts by mentioning uh, Abraham and the genealogy of Abraham leading up to Jesus. Mark's Gospel is different in that it starts with John the Baptist. Luke's gospel is different in that it starts with Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were priests. John starts with Jesus and a new beginning. God himself visiting our planet. Adam was created, and there was a beginning, but Adam fell. Jesus comes along, and there's a new beginning, and he recreates everything. If you like, this is how you can view it. Adam messed up everything at creation. Jesus came to fix up everything and make a new creation. In fact, the title of the message this morning is New Beginnings with the Second Adam. If you're not sure what you're seeing behind me on the screen, if you're watching this on YouTube or on Life by Design, or if you're in one of our overflow rooms or in the foyer, what's behind me on the platform is a picture of the old Adam and a picture of the new Adam. Both ended up in a garden, but one came to the earth and messed everything up. The other came to the earth and fixed everything up. The first Adam failed, but the second Adam repaired what he failed. Let's read John chapter 1 and verse 1. It starts in the beginning. Just like the book of Genesis, here is the new beginning. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So when Adam was created, Jesus was there. Notice what it says. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus was in Genesis where we read about Adam being created. The Bible says that God said, let us make man in our image. Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit made Adam. And now Jesus in John's gospel is revealed as coming to fix up everything that Adam messed up. It says of Jesus here, in him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. I love this verse, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How many of you know there's a lot of criticism on the internet, and on Instagram and Twitter about the church, and the failures of the church, but the church has never been extinguished. Through all its failures, through all the centuries, it's continued. Why? Because Jesus is the light of his church. It continues in John to speak about Jesus. The Word became flesh, and he made his dwelling amongst us. He came personally. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, 
full of grace and truth. How did we know Jesus was God's son? He came to recreate. He put eyes into blind people. He raised dead people. He multiplied food. He made water into wine. Only the creator can do that. That's how we know Jesus is God. It says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We skip down to verse 29 for the sake of time. It says, the next day John, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here Jesus is presented to us as God's Son who created and began everything. He is now here presented as the one who is going to save everything as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He comes personally and he comes to die because of what Adam brought into the world and to give us a new beginning. Now, if we skip down to John chapter 3, and forgive me for reading so much scripture, but the Bible is very important today on this Good Friday. Rather than sentiment, we need the Word of God. We see Jesus speaking about this new beginning and explaining what he means. If the first Adam messed it all up, the second Adam doesn't just come to pay for sins, but he comes to start a whole new season and to bring a whole new change to human beings. John chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. This man was a high up religious person, knew the Bible, knew the law. And uh, he came to Jesus at night because he was afraid. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, I'm going to pause you for a moment because I want you to see Jesus doesn't answer his question or issue. It's almost like Jesus says, and? And then Jesus, it's almost like Jesus says, don't worry about that. Listen here. Are you with me? So verse 3, Jesus replied. In fact, he doesn't really reply. Jesus said, <laughs> very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That word they see is both enter and perceive. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. It's being facetious. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water, that's baptism, and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. In other words, if you come from Adam, you're just flesh. But spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Notice, you must, imperative, be born again. So he comes to bring a new beginning, and he comes to tell us how to do it. It's by being born again. And he comes to bring a new start. Now, this Jewish man would probably go, aha, because he'd suddenly get it. Israel was born the first time when God took Jacob and changed his name to Israel and promised him, like he promised Abraham, from you is going to come a great people and they're going to enter a great land. A nation was born. But then you all know they ended up in Egypt, in slavery. Then God called them out of Egypt by Moses and they go through the Red Sea, which is a kind of a baptism. And when they went through the Red Sea, they were born again. And they came out a new people, God's people, in a new land. It's a picture of the Christian church. We are born from Adam, but Adam was a failure and a sinner. Now Jesus comes along and he dies for our sins and he wants us to embrace him and get baptized and follow him and we get born again and we become a new people. Not just church attenders, brand new beginning. That's what this day is about. This is not a religious day where we follow a few more rules. We eat some hot cross buns and then we go away. No, we need to be a new people. A brand new people. And we are called in the Bible a new creation. So notice here in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. Paul writing says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, because that's got to do with flesh, means anything. What counts is the new creation. Not natural procedures, not religion, but a spiritual condition where you are completely changed. That's why Jesus died. He died to remove sin so that we could become brand new. It's a new beginning and a new birth. Are you with me? 
Genesis was a beginning and it was creation, but through Jesus, our sin's been removed and we have a new creation and a new beginning. Am I making sense? In fact, in a devotional book called The Daily Bread or Our Daily Bread, I used to read these for many years, one of these books, the author here, in speaking to us about how this new birth works, he says this, the new birth is not an overhaul of the old wreck or a new paint job. The old Adamic nature is so incorrigibly corrupt that even God will not attempt to fix it up. He insists on completely rejecting the old hulk and making a new man. The old nature received at birth is hopeless and dressing it up with education and culture only makes it more dangerous than before. Are you getting this? He goes on to say, the more we work on the old man, the more deceptive it becomes. Do you know why the sinner must be born again, he asks? Because he was born wrong the first time. He doesn't have to be taught to go his own way. It comes naturally to him. He ends by saying, but the new birth, he's turned around and headed in the right direction. He's not just attending church. He is being transformed by the new Adam. Are you with me? In fact, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says it again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. New person, new direction, new beginnings, new creation. Now, in today's message, I want to speak to it in two halves. I want to ask two questions. The first question is, why do we need a new beginning? And why am I asking that question is I've discovered that many people believe they need a little bit of religion, but they don't need to be born again. Because a lot of people erroneously and incorrectly believe that they are children of God just because they were born. In fact, when we were young people and the Woodstock Pop Festival and the whole hippie movement was on, there was a song written. Well, I came upon a child of God. He was walking along the road. You know, that's when you had hair. <laughs> Everyone thinks they're a child of God just because they're born. But that's not true. You see, it's like thinking like this. It's thinking like a, a carpenter or a cabinet maker. When he makes a cabinet, he suddenly calls it his child. No, it's not. It's a creation of his, but it's not his child. In order to have a child, he needs to have a woman and, and plant seed, and, and then he'll have a child, and that'll be his child. And so people say, well, I'm a child of God. No, I know you feel there's all this one humanity and love, 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 and all that. No, no, you're a child of the devil if you come from Adam. Because Adam's a sinner, and Adam has reproduced sin in you. So you, it's, it's like saying, you know, because a tree was created by God, it's a child of God. No, it's not. It's a creation of God. You need to be born again. Because we are sinners, we come from Adam, and there's, a, there, there's something wrong with us. Now, here we start to read about the new Adam, old Adam, in 1 Corinthians 15, just a few verses here. The first man, Adam, was of the dust of the earth. In other words, he was created from the ground. The second Adam is of heaven. In other words, he pre-existed. He was there before the beginning of time. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth basically disobedient. And as is the heavenly man, so also those who are of heaven. That's us if we're born again and we're considered righteous. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. So we came from Adam, we're disobedient, we're sinners, but now through Jesus we have a new beginning and we can be different. Am I making sense? The question is, why do we need a new beginning? Is because we originally come from Adam. How do we describe who this old Adam is? It's like taking an apple. It's been polished. You know, red apples are polished and they're put in a dish. You pick it up, you go, oh, wow. And then as you turn around, you find the other side is rotten. And then when you poke at the rottenness, out comes a worm. Ah, and, and this is what people say. It's the environment. No. Did you know that a rotten apple with a worm inside, the worm did not come from outside. It came from inside. What insects do is they go to apple trees and they lay the eggs in the blossom. Then when the apple is formed, the worm comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. 
And because we are born from the old Adam, we have sin engendered in us, the eggs. So as we grow, sin comes out of us. Don't blame the environment. If you come from the old Adam, which all of us do, we need to be born again because sin is in us. Are you with me? Someone said it like this. We are all like the moon. On one side, all looks well, but the other side is dark. Let me describe it to you like this, and some of you will understand this. There is a wonderful soccer team right now that seems to be winning. <laughs> they mostly wear red. <laughs> but if you understand soccer, what often happens is one man will run what's called offside. And the whistle will blow and the whole team will be sent back. And it's like that. You can be a winning team, but someone will always run offside. Could be a man called Bruno, I think. And then they're all sent back. That's what sin's like. There's so much about us that wins. There's so much that's shiny and bright, but then there's so much that's like, oh, my word. And we keep looking at the wrong answers. We keep looking in the wrong sources for the answer to this. We need a new beginning because sin is in us. The way someone described it, it's like this. It's like a man's beard. You can keep shaving it, but it keeps growing back. You can keep covering it up, but it keeps coming back. In fact, J.C. Ryle, in his book, Holiness, he describes it like this. He says, the very animals whose smell is most offensive to us have no idea that they are offensive and are not offensive to one another. And man, fallen man, has just no idea what a vile thing sin is in the sight of God. That's why when you mix with sinners and they're all sinning and everyone's happy because everyone stinks. <laughs> but when you get born again, suddenly you're like, sorry, can't handle the smell anymore. You discover what's wrong. Isn't that true? And we've had revolutions and we've had technological revolutions and we think man is so highly evolved now, but he actually isn't. Winston Churchill said it like this. He says, certain it is that while men are gathering knowledge and power with ever-increasing speed, their virtues and their wisdom have not shown any notable improvement as the centuries have rolled. Under sufficient stress, starvation, terror, warlike passion, and even cold intellectual frenzy, the modern man we know so well will do the most terrible deeds, and his modern woman will back him up. Isn't that true of the guy who escaped from jail recently? <laughs> who helped him? A modern woman. People say there's no such thing as sin. You know, years ago, a famous story is told of the London Times where a journalist wrote a whole article about all the problems in the world, and then he ended it with this big phrase, which was sort of in large print, you know, what's wrong with the world? And famously, G.K. Chesterton, the author, wrote to the newspaper and he said this, Dear editor, what's wrong with the world? I am. Faithfully yours, G.K. Chesterton. The problem with the world is human beings that come from Adam. In fact, Lucien Le Botonnet, the French religious philosopher, said this. He said, there's only one problem, the problem of ourselves from which all others derive. You see, if you're born from Adam, Adam produced not righteousness, but he produced perversion and lust and sickness and disease and hate and all the wrong drives and tendencies. And, and basically, he kept reproducing sin. The Bible calls sin homartia in the Greek, which actually means this, to fall short, to miss the mark. To miss the mark but here's the, here's the key phrase, to have a fatal flaw or to be flawed. It's like we're cracked. And you don't notice it immediately, but when you look in the light, you can see every human being that came from the first Adam is cracked, and we're all infected with sin. In fact, if you look up in a dictionary, in different dictionaries, what the definition of the old Adam actually means, Collins Dictionary defines it like this, and I, and I like the way they try and avoid it here. Collins Dictionary says of the old Adam, the evil supposedly inherent in human nature. They're trying to deny it. But the old Adam means that evil nature. Merriam-Webster's dictionary, unregenerate human nature. And the free dictionary, the evil or reckless side of human nature. In Christian symbolism, the old Adam represents fallen man as contrasted with the second Adam, 
Jesus Christ. Now let's read again here from Romans where it explains to us clearly how this all works, the old and the new. Romans chapter 5. Are you all with me? Let's read Romans 5. It says, Therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, the first Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. So it's like, a, it's like COVID. It's like a highly infectious thing that everybody gets. It, it, it says, um, but the free gift is not like the trespass. Notice, free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, how much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many? And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, he keeps harping on Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive, that's the key, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Can you see how it keeps contrasting Adam with Jesus? Adam messed it up, Jesus fixed it up. Adam sinned and there's no hope, Jesus forgives us. He goes on to say, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. We are not like the first Adam. We are like the second Adam. You know, when Adam was created, think of it this, this way. He was, he was put in a perfect world, this perfect man. But very quickly, everything was lost. When Jesus came, he was the perfect man, but he was put in an imperfect world. Why? Because he wants to restore us back to what we were before. You know, Adam was made in the image of God, but the minute he was disobedient, that image was marred. That's why you can go to a prison and you can look at a person and you can see somehow they're human. That there's something about them that's lovely. And then on the other side, it's like, my gosh. Because you can see the old Adam and then you can see the potential in them for being a new Adam. Are you with me? In the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming, at the base of the Rocky Mountains, there is an interesting lake, and it's called Jackson Lake. If you look at this picture on screen today, you'll see that the mountains are perfectly, exactly reproduced on the waters of that lake. Isn't it quite amazing? It's almost like a mirror. The reason is this because there's no distortion. But just take a single stone and throw it into that lake, and the whole of the image of the mountains is distorted. And that's what happened, happened when Adam sinned. The image of God in us was distorted. That's why you can look at people and you can almost see they're godlike, but then you can see, oh my word. And that's why we need to be born again, because the image of God in us was destroyed. Arthur Brisbane was a famous editor, and he describes our world like this as I wrap up this first question. He says this, he says, we may sweep the world clean of militarism. We may scrub the world white of autocracy. We may carpet it with democracy and drape it with the flag of republicanism. We may hang on the walls the thrilling pictures of freedom here, the signing of America's independence there, the thrilling portrait of Joan of Arc yonder and the Magna Carta on this side and the inspiring picture of Garibaldi. In other words, the great pictures of freedom. In South Africa, we would hang a picture of Mandela. That's what he's saying. And you can do all this stuff, but he goes on to say, he says we may spend energy and effort to make the world a paradise itself where the lion of capitalism can lie down with the proletarian lamb. But if we turn into that splendid room again, mankind with the same old heart, deceitful and desperately wicked, we may expect to clean house again, not many days hence. What we need is a peace conference with the Prince of Peace. So you can try and fix the world, but we all come from the old Adam. That's why we need a new beginning. Are you with me? My second question this morning is simply this. How do we receive a new beginning? How do we get this new beginning? Well, at the cross it was reversed. 
Jesus came to reverse what Adam did. And if you think of Adam, think of when Adam was created. The Bible says that God put him into a deep sleep. You all remember that? Put him into a deep sleep, and then he cut open his side, and out of his side, he brought Eve. Adam could not create Eve himself. So God puts him to sleep, blood is shed, and out of his side comes Eve. Jesus comes along, and he sleeps in death. And to prove his death, they puncture his side, and blood and water flow out. And what is the product of Jesus, the new Adam dying? The church is born from his side, his bride. The exact reversal of what happened with Adam happens in Jesus. But don't stop there, because you can miss something. When Adam received Eve as his bride, the Lord brought him, and she was to be a help meet to him. The church is not born from Jesus' side to only attend church now and again and acknowledge him at Christmas and Easter. The church is meant to be his help meet, to serve him with their time, their talent, and their treasure, which is what Rivers Church does. It's not religion. It's a complete transformation because we understand our new beginning. Are you with me? And so Jesus comes to birth this new thing called the church. Adam dies as a result of his sin, but Jesus is raised from the dead, which we will celebrate on uh, Sunday morning. But here's the thing I want you to notice also what Jesus did and how he reversed it, is when Adam was presented with the tree in the garden, God said to him, don't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he did, and what happened? Sin came and the fall came. Jesus is presented with a tree called the cross, and he hangs on it and dies. And what happens? As a result of his obedience, life comes to us. And forgiveness comes to us. Exact reversal. And so how do we receive this new beginning? Is by believing in Jesus and receiving the new life he gives and turning our back on Adam. Blaise Pascal put it like this. Jesus was in a garden, not of delight as the first Adam, in which he destroyed himself and the whole human race, but in one on, in agony of agony in which he saved himself and the whole human race. See, because Jesus died for us, we can have a brand new beginning now. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees us as sinners, but he sees us as new creations. Why? Because of the new Adam, the second Adam. Do you know, it's very interesting that if you look at the Chinese word for righteousness, it looks like one symbol, look on the screen with me, it looks like one symbol, the Chinese word for righteousness, but it's actually made up of two words, the character at the top and the character at the bottom. It takes two characters to make righteousness. Why? Well, it's very simple. The character at the bottom stands for I or me, and the character at the top stands for lamb. So when I have the lamb of God over me or I, I become righteous. So when God looks down from heaven and he sees me or I, or you, he sees the lamb, the one who originally created everything, who's now recreated us, and he forgives us and he sees us as his new creation, as his children. I think it's pretty marvelous. Pretty marvelous. Here's the thing. Adam ate of the tree and it brought death. When Jesus died on the tree and we eat of the fruit of his tree, we live. Look at this, and I'm nearly done. John chapter 6 and verse 51. I am the living bread that comes from, down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. His death pardons us. It is a gift, as we've read, a free gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You just receive it. And if you receive it, you get born again. The question is, do you believe it? And will you receive it? Because many people know about it, but don't receive it. It's not automatic. It's got to be received. We need to be born again. And this is how we are born again and given a new beginning. As I wrap up this morning, before we take communion, before I pray with you, actually, in 1829 in Philadelphia, there was a very interesting case of a man called George Wilson. George Wilson robbed the U.S. mail with a friend of his, and in the process someone was killed. They caught George Wilson and his friend. His friend was hanged, 
and George Wilson was due to be hanged, but George Wilson had very influential friends in high places, and they got together and petitioned the president at the time, Andrew Jackson, and appealed to him for their friend, George uh, Wilson. Well, the president gave a pardon, as presidents do, and uh, the pardon was sent to the prison, and when George Wilson heard about the pardon, he said, I don't accept it. They said, are you kidding? He said, I don't accept it. So they went back and they told the prison. The prison said, well, I've given it. They went to the, the governor general or the, the chief prosecutor, I think at the time, the, 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 the chief marshal, as they call him. They went to him and he said, what do we do? He said, well, it's been issued. If he doesn't receive it, he's not forgiven. He's not pardoned. So guess what happened? Because it was given and he wouldn't receive it, he ended up languishing in jail for 10 years until he finally came to his senses. I've been forgiven. He received the pardon and he was set free. And you know what a lot of people do? They know they pardon, but they never make it their own. And because they don't make it their own, they are in a prison of sin when they needn't be. You know, it's a free gift. We just need to believe it and receive it. As I close this morning, we're going to watch a video in a moment. How many of you remember the thief on the cross? One thief on the one side, one thief on the other, and they're arguing with Jesus. And then the one thief turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's not studying the Bible. He's not doing anything. He's just asking. Never been to church. Never had Holy Communion. And Jesus turns to him and says this to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's have a look at Pastor Alistair Begg speaking about the thief on the cross, and then I'm going to pray with you. you think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense, I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you were, you were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend, You've never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, we, uh, uh, did you, Excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor, Ranger. So we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you, are, you, are, you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, uh, let's just go to the doctrine of Scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. It's that simple, church. The man on the middle cross, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you can come. Do you believe it? Do you want to receive it? In a moment, I'm going to pray with you. And for the benefit of the people that are here for the first time, we pray for people at the end of every service. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, outside and inside. I'm not going to make you stand up, and I'm not going to call you to the platform. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand because I'm going to pray with you. In fact, everyone in the room is going to pray with you, aren't we, church? And I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Have you made him Lord? Have you experienced that being born again? Have you experienced the new birth? It's up to you to receive it. Because the man on the middle cross says, if you receive it, you can have a new beginning. You don't have to be perfect. You can have a new beginning. Maybe you're a Christian and you've drifted far away and you've forgotten. I'm actually born again from the side of the one who suffered. That I might be his bride. And that I might be his helpmeet. But you've become so distant. Maybe today you come back and you're part of that body of Christ. That, 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 that new nation with a new beginning. That new creation. If that's you this morning, you need Jesus, you need to come back. Pray with me like this. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. For your son, Jesus Christ. For your son, Jesus Christ. The second Adam. The second Adam. Who, gives who gives me a new beginning. Thank you for his death on the cross. Thank you for his death on the cross. That paid for all my sins. Paid for all my sins. I, believe in him today. I believe in him today. I make him Lord of my life today. Lord of my life today. And I fully trust him. And I fully trust him. 
for my salvation. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive and cleanse me. And I commit to follow you, Father, as your bride today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God thanks this morning.